Chapter 15 is back on the shorter side with regard to chapter lengths. There are only three sections to chapter 15. So we'll have three total videos, one for each subchapter here. And though it's shorter, we've really got some new key ideas that are introduced in the chapter. And 15.1, we'll get precipitation and dissolution, kind of building on some of the equilibrium information that we had in 13 and 14. And then another really important idea in 15.2, covering Lewis acids and bases and coordination complexes and what we can do with that. And then putting the ideas together in 15.3, which deals with multiple equilibria occurring simultaneously. Uh, so to dive into 15.1, think about back when we first learned the Van Hoff factor in chapter 11. And we sort of discussed the fact that solubility isn't always clear cut. It's not always that something is either insoluble or completely soluble, right? Or, you know, a weak electrolyte versus a strong electrolyte. Some of that stuff isn't always clear cut. And that's what 15.1 is all about. Right? The equilibria that are actually occurring in solution when we have things dissolving or precipitating. Thinking about the equilibrium between a solid right, being put into a liquid and the aqueous state when it is dissolved in that liquid. So, and that is expressed by using the solubility product constant. So we'll get yet another K here in chapter 15. And this one will be KSP, where SP is for solubility product. There are a lot of applications where we want to control how something that's slightly soluble dissolves. Okay? And we can do that by applications of Le Chatelier's principle that we got from chapter 13, certain things that we can control. Okay. So to think about this, let's consider silver chloride. Silver chloride is sparingly soluble, okay? which means if we had an excess of silver chloride to a solution, it dissolves to a small extent, right? It's not like sodium chloride where a bulk of your NaCl is gonna dissolve until you exceed the solubility limit, right? Silver chloride has a much lower solubility limit. So we just get, right, the key where there's small extent of the silver chloride dissolving right, and dissociating into silver plus and chloride, Cl minus in the aqueous state, right? Notice we're going from solid to aqueous. And here's what that would look like in the image form, right, again, sparingly soluble. Most of our silver chloride is staying in the solid state. Just a little bit is dissolving and being solvated by water. That, just like what we learned in 13 and 14, is a dynamic equilibrium. Yep. And when we're writing the expression for these solubility products, we list our solid as the reactant and our dissolved aqueous ions as the products, right? Jumping back two slides here, solid reactant aqueous products. Okay. So when we do that, we have an equilibrium expression and we can write an expression to find the equilibrium constant, right? As I mentioned before, called KSP. And in the case of silver chloride, right? If you go back and look at that reaction, in this case, the solubility product constant is just equal to the concentration of silver multiplied by the concentration of chloride. Because remember from the earlier chapters, solids do not appear in these equilibrium expressions. Okay? So even though my expression is uh, products over reactants, the reactant is a solid and thus doesn't appear. And that's the nice thing about these KSPs. Typically, I only have to worry about the solids. Or sorry, no, I don't worry about the solids. I only worry about the products, the aqueous species. So here are some examples of some solubility product constants. And these are always small values, right? Look at these things, 10 to the negative 6 to 10 to the negative 38. These are always really small values, always less than 1, because we are, by definition, in Chapter 15, dealing with things that are sparingly soluble. They only dissolve a little bit. So we always have tiny equilibrium constants. We're always thinking about situations where the equilibrium lies to the left towards the reactants, towards the solids. Okay. So another thing, another important application for chapter 15 is using these solubility product constants to determine what is the most soluble. 
Okay. In this case, it's going to be for this table, copper chloride, okay, because it has the largest equilibrium constant, even though these are all small numbers, because remember, these are negative exponents. So in this case, iron hydroxide is the least soluble at 10 to the negative 38. So you should know how to write equations and equilibrium expressions, how to solve for a KSP. So this ties together a lot of ideas. Nomenclature from way back in chapter two, what is magnesium hydroxide? Well, you have to know that it's not just MgOH, right? Because it is a group two ion, right? we've got M, Oh, my cursor doesn't want to work. There we go. Mg, right? That's plus two. Hydroxide, OH2. Uh, that's magnesium hydroxide. That's a key idea. Uh, if we're writing a balanced equation for it dissolving, that was solid. Uh, it is in equilibrium with Mg2 plus in the aqueous state. And this is the key thing that's different from silver chloride coming up next with two hydroxides in the aqueous state. So that means when I write out the expression for my KSP, I still don't have to worry about that solid reactant. Okay, that's good. So it's the concentration of magnesium okay, multiplied by the concentration of hydroxide but the big difference that I alluded to, make sure you're using your coefficients now as superscripts, so this one needs to be squared. Okay, so that's the equation, a little messy with that initial M. That is the expression for the KSP. Okay, so know how to write those from chapter 15. Moving on. Uh, we can tie these KSP expressions in to solubility we defined the solubility limit as the maximum possible concentration of a solute that can be dissolved in a solution at a specified temperature and pressure. If we know a solid solubility expressed in molarity, right, because those two, those terms in brackets are always in molarity, just like chapter 13 and 14, we can calculate solubility. This is called the molar solubility. Uh, in slide 10 here, we have a practice problem to do that, okay, saturated solution of magnesium hydroxide. We're given the concentration of magnesium and we're asked to calculate the solubility product constant. Okay, we've got three practice problems in a row. I'll have videos for all of them okay, uploaded separately. The keys for solving this one, you know magnesium, you use that value to find the concentration of hydroxide and then use the concentration of both of those to find the KSP value. Solubility product constant should be 2.0 times 10 to the minus 13. Okay. Now working on it the other way, you're given the KSP and we're asked to calculate the molar solubility of calcium and hydroxide. Okay, Write the expression, plug in the KSP, solve for X, uh, in this case, X, your molar concentration of calcium should be 1.3 times 10 to the minus two. And then yet a third here for thallium chloride, a little bit harder of a problem because we're given a different concentration unit, 3.2 grams per liter at 20 C. Okay, now we need to take that. Always remember to use molarity. Okay, So first solve for the molarity of thallium and chloride, and then use those to solve for the KSP. So three practice problems, I'll have supplemental videos for all three. Okay. Another idea from chapter 15, just like in 13, we can compare K to Q, right? Compare your K value to your Q to tell you how a reaction is going to behave. Is something going to precipitate? Okay. That's something I can ask you if you know the solubility product concentration. Sorry, if you know the solubility product and the concentrations, is something going to dissolve? Yep. So here's what you have to think to yourself. If Q is equal to KSP, it's at equilibrium. Nothing's going to dissolve or precipitate. If Q is less than KSP, your solid's going to dissolve until 
in solution until the values are equal to one another. If Q is greater than KSP, you've added too much of the solid to the solution. Precipitation is going to occur. Uh, and that is probably the focus of 15.1, right? determining if something will precipitate or not. Uh, so we can establish these dissolution precipitation equilibrium by adding solid to water. That's one way to do it. But the other one that we haven't mentioned yet is thinking about mixing two separate solutions together that contain the two separate ions. Now they come together and the question is, will they precipitate? because your reactant's gonna shift and fix itself until Q is equal to KSP. So we need to ask ourselves when it's doing that, is it gonna dissolve or is it going to precipitate? So this is the type of question that asks that. Okay? Will potassium perchlorate here precipitate when I add two solutions, 20 milliliters of 0.05 molar potassium with 80 milliliters of 0.5 molar perchlorate, okay? given the KSP. So what you need to do to solve this problem, write the expression, solve for Q because you don't know if we're at equilibrium or not, and compare that value of Q to K. Okay. Now in this situation, you're gonna solve for a Q value four times 10 to the negative third. Okay. 10 to the negative third is less than your K value. So no, you will not precipitate because going back a slide here, right, Q is less than K. So it's not going to precipitate. Those things will stay dissolved. And again, I'll have a supplemental video for that. Yep. So write the expression, solve for Q, compare to K to determine if something will precipitate. Yep. Basically, this slide is verbally just telling us what we've already talked about. Solids will only precipitate when the value of Q, when they're mixed together, exceeds the value of K. And one other thing I want to jump back to slide 15 here, make sure you account for the volume change when these things are mixed together when you're solving for the new molarities. Like your M1V1 equals M2V2 from way back in chapter three, think about that. So if we know the concentration of one ion and the value of K, what we can also do is calculate the concentration for the missing ion, the last player in that game, that must be exceeded in order for precipitation to start. Okay? So if we think about like oxalate, which is used in blood collection, uh, it's a tool because uh, blood's not gonna clot if calcium ions are removed from the plasma, right? You don't want your blood to clot up in these tubes if it has to be analyzed, okay? So blood collection tubes contain oxalate in order to pull calcium out of solution. So let's think about that for this example problem, which we'll also have a supplemental video. Uh, concentration of calcium, 2.2 times 10 to the negative third molar, well, how much oxalate would I have to put into that tube to pull out the calcium and prevent it from affecting the blood clotting? Okay. So I know calcium with 2.2 times 10 to the negative third molar. I know K, okay. I solve for the concentration of oxalate in that KSP expression, and any value higher than that will cause a precipitation to occur. And in this case, the answer to this one's one times 10 to the negative six molar for oxalate. And that brings us to the final idea of 15.1 here, selective precipitation. And what this is, is a, a tool that's used in qualitative, ion, uh, qualitative analysis, excuse me. Uh, so we've got one type of cation in solution and two different types of anions, or you can flip it around one anion with multiple different types of cations. And you can take advantage of whichever ionic species has the smallest KSP is going to precipitate first. Yeah, that's what selective precipitation is all about. Solutions containing two or more ions that can form insoluble compounds with the same counter ion. Right? You can use it to remove individual ions from solution. And if you increase the counter ion concentration slowly, right, you can precipitate ions out individually as long as the solubilities are sufficiently different. And a good rule of thumb is about a hundred fold different. 
So something that's 10 to the negative two versus 10 to the negative four, for example. If they're that far apart, you don't want them to be super similar, then whatever's less soluble will fully precipitate out of solution before whatever is more soluble even starts to do it. So that's what selective precipitation is about. You're targeting something and forcing it to come out of solution. And this is what that type of problem looks like. Okay, I'm thinking about silver chloride and silver bromide. So you see 10 to the negative 10, 10 to the minus 13. They are at least 100 fold different. Yeah. Smaller KSP value is silver bromide. So right off the bat, you know that's going to precipitate first. Yeah. So before we even look at the problem, the last thing asks, what would be the formula of the precipitate? Well, it's going to be silver bromide because that's the thing that's less soluble. The more challenging part of the question is what silver concentration does precipitation begin? So the steps to solving this problem, as you'll see in the supplementary video, take the smaller KSP, that's always the one you're gonna work with, the smaller KSP, write the expression for silver bromide, okay, the KSP expression. You're told you're half molar in both ions, including bromide, so you plug in 0.5 for BR into this KSP expression and then solve for the concentration of silver at which the precipitation begins. Okay. Uh, difficult conceptually, no more difficult mathematically. So again, that is selective precipitation. Okay. We also need to consider something known as the common ion effect. If we've got an extra player in solution, it can affect our solubility. Okay. If I'm dealing with a certain equilibrium in pure water, and I add another solution in there that has one of my ions that is involved in the equilibrium, it's going to shift the equilibrium towards the left, towards the solid reactant. Okay. Because what we've done, if we have one of the ions that's involved in our equilibrium, right? it shifts the equilibrium away from that increase in concentration, which for KSP expressions is always on my product set. Okay? So compared with pure water, the solubility of an ionic compound is always less in an aqueous solution that contains the common ion. That is the common ion effect. Okay? So it's difficult to force more to dissolve. Right? You can't just pour more into the solution because it's a solid reactant, it doesn't appear in your expression. You can't just pour an infinite amount of salt into water, for example. The only way to force these to dissolve more without changing the pressure or temperature is to remove the products from solution. So that's what the common ion effect is about. And this is what a common ion problem would look like. Calculate the molar solubility of aluminum hydroxide in a 0.015 molar solution of aluminum nitrate. And aluminum nitrate is fully soluble because nitrates, anything bonded to nitrate is always fully soluble, right? So now I've got to write out the KSP expression for aluminum hydroxide, ALOH3. Okay? But when I plug in my initial concentrations of those ions, it's not going to be zero for aluminum, right? It's 0.015. So that's going to reduce my overall concentration that can dissolve, my solubility will be lower due to the common ion effect. And the answer to this one, one times 10 to the negative 10. So that wraps up 15.1, lots of different practice examples. If you were good on chapter 13 and chapter 14, chances are you're good with this. It's no more challenging. But if not, these equilibriums and these K expressions will continue to be a theme. So make sure you try all these practice examples, come up with the answer. If you can't, then view the supplementary videos. That'll be a big focus both here in 15.1 and other additional expressions coming in 15.2.